Good afternoon. <clears throat> the first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions, and the first portfolio is Constitution, External Affairs and Culture. As ever, I would make a plea for succinct questions and answers to allow as many members as possible to have their chance. Uh, question number one, Mark Griffin not lodged. Question number two, Gillian Mackay. To, oh, apologies, presiding officer. My question has just disappeared off my screen. To ask the Scottish Government whether the UK Government has communicated any intention to provide exemptions to the United Kingdom Internal Market Act 2020 in relation to legislation passed by the Scottish Parliament. Cabinet Secretary Angus Robertson. Presiding Officer, the Internal Market Act radically undermines the devolution settlement in Scotland and was imposed on this Parliament without its consent. We can see the outcome most clearly with the deposit return scheme. Laws passed in this Parliament are now threatened by the Act, placing the whole scheme at risk, including significant industry investment. Regrettably, the UK Government has yet to reach a decision on excluding Scotland's deposit return scheme from the Internal Market Act. And we've been engaging with the UK Government on this issue for nearly two years now. UK Ministers themselves have acknowledged that we have followed the agreed exclusions process. We cannot wait any longer in providing businesses the clarity they urgently need. We need a positive decision from the UK Government, and we need it now. Gillian Mackay. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I have previously welcomed the creation of 140 new jobs in Motherwell as part of DRS, just some of the hundreds of jobs created across Scotland as part of the scheme. But these jobs are now at risk because the UK Government's deliberate delaying over the IMA exclusion. There are many other issues that, that are being considered that may need an IMA exclusion, including a potential ban on disposable vapes. The common frameworks are meant to provide a forum for timely and collaborative decision making, but does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the DRS experience has shown them to be ineffective and could potentially put at risk some of the public health and environmental measures we're trying to take? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I agree with the member. The Scottish Government uh, warned that the Internal Market Act would undermine devolution and that it would create confusion and uncertainty for businesses. Sadly, we've been proven right, as the example from the member's region shows. Brexit has been used as a pretext for eroding devolution and the powers of the Scottish Parliament, but common frameworks do offer one of the few options available to us for engagement on mitigating some of the effects of the Brexit that Scotland did not vote for. The Scottish Government has spent a great deal of time trying to make common frameworks work, as intended, for the UK Government to now show a similar commitment to take full account of the work undertaken collaboratively through the Common Framework and agree to an Internal Market Act exclusion and lift the threat of the Act from Scotland's deposit return scheme. A supplementary, Alistair Allen. Uh, does the Cabinet uh, Secretary believe that the tensions arising from the UK Internal Market Act demonstrate that under Westminster's control, Scotland's devolution settlement can be undermined at the whim of the UK Government, particularly by any hypothetical Scottish Secretary who might harbour any scarcely uh, concealed desire to act like a, government, a Governor General? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Presiding Officer, as I have noted before, a Brexit which Scotland did not vote for is being used to roll back the powers of a Parliament that Scotland did vote for. The Internal Market Act imposed on this Parliament without its consent is the result. Despite that, we have acted in good faith to mitigate the Act's worst effects, engaging through common frameworks to that end. And that is what we are doing in respect of Scotland's deposit return scheme. We need the UK Government to finally recognise the evidence gathered through the common framework, agree to an exclusion and remove the threat the Act poses to the scheme. UK Ministers have themselves acknowledged that the Scottish Government has followed the agreed procedure. The fact that we are still waiting for a decision shows the vulnerability of the devolution settlement and the ability of the Scottish Parliament to use its powers to benefit the people of this country. Question number three, Pam Duncan Clancy to ask the Scottish Government whether it is considering replacing any retained EU law. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the UK Government's retained EU law bill is still reckless legislation, despite the sensible change removing the automatic sunset of uh, rule, um, a retained EU law at the end of this year. Vital protections remain at risk, and UK ministers can still act in devolved areas without a requirement for consent from Scottish ministers or indeed from this Parliament. This is unacceptable and why we continue to call for the bill to be withdrawn. We do not have plans to use powers in the bill to alter existing policy 
but continue to assess this as part of an ongoing work, including to prevent laws from being lost. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary said in his statement on the 9th of May that the loss of Erasmus was loss of opportunity for young people, and we know it also has a loss to the economy. So whilst young people in England and Wales are accessing a replacement Turing or Tate scheme, young people in Scotland are still waiting, despite the SNP committing to a replacement in the 2021 manifesto. So does the Cabinet Secretary accept that this is yet another broken promise from the SNP to Scotland's young people? Well, I'm sure the presiding, the presiding officer wouldn't wish me to answer questions. Uh, I Cabinet Secretary, just, uh, sorry uh, to interrupt. Um, I, I appreciate the questions seem to be a bit uh, wide, but uh, if there's anything else that the Cabinet Secretary would wish to add, perhaps as regards matters within his ministerial responsibility, well, he could always do so. Indeed. Well, the question that was put was relating to retained EU law, and the question of either the Erasmus scheme or Turing doesn't fall within the ambit of retained EU law. We, we're going to continue to work with uh, partners, including members of the House of Lords, to do everything that we can to mitigate uh, the disaster which the retained EU law bill um, still poses. We don't know the final um, outcome of that legislative uh, process. In terms of the wider questions that Pam Duncan Glancy has asked, I'm always happy to answer questions at the appropriate stage about how we can maximise our educational cooperation between Scotland uh, and the European Union. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I call, uh, sorry, question number four is not large. Question number five, Ruth McGuire. To ask the Scottish Government how it's supporting culture and the arts in Cunningham South constituency. Cabinet Secretary. Um, our culture strategy sets out our ambitions for nurturing culture and creativity across all of Scotland's communities. We support a range of initiatives and organisations in the Cunningham South constituency, including the Culture Collective Programme, the Youth Music Initiative and the Scottish Maritime Museum. For example, the Traditional Arts and Culture Scotland is supported through the Culture Collective and is delivered by Creative Scotland. They bring together artists and people in local communities, and one area of focus is Kilwinning in North Ayrshire. Tracts have received £345,000 uh, in total to support projects across nine communities. Ruth McGuire. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. There are many barriers that prevent our citizens, particularly families on lower incomes, from accessing art and culture, whether that's lack of expendable time, distance from events or festivals or affordability. How can the Scottish Government ensure that public money invested in arts and culture is to the benefit of all, whether that's those attending or indeed performers and artists creating out with the main cities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Ruth McGuire raises an excellent point and one that is central to the work we're doing. Our major cultural programmes actively work to break down these sort of uh, barriers. Our Youth Music Initiative, which recently celebrated its 20th anniversary, operates across the country in rural and urban areas. It aims to tackle inequality, to engage young people who would not otherwise be able to participate in meaningful and high-quality music-making opportunities. And our Culture Collective Programme, funded by over £10 million to date, has provided free, engaging, community-focused activity, again, across the length and breadth of the country, uh, and over the last two years has focused on access and participation. Later this year, we'll publish our Culture Strategy Action Plan Refresh, which will provide much more detail our, about our ambitions in this space. Question number six, Sharon Dowie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how it is supporting the arts sector. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Well, question six, forgive me, presiding uh, officer, and to the, uh, to the member in question. Uh, I understand that this is an incredibly worrying time for the culture uh, sector, and the Scottish Government continues to provide significant support to the culture sector. This includes funding to Creative Scotland, totalling £35 million for the regularly funded organisations, um, more than £9 million for youth projects, more than £2 million for festivals. The Scottish Government is committed to maintaining uh, the 22.496 million pounds of funding for the five national performing companies, three million pounds for the VNA in Dundee, and the Scottish Government is providing an additional 2.1 million pounds to support increased costs in the national collections, reflecting the high fixed costs that these organisations have. Sharon Dowie. Thank you. 
The arts sector plays a crucial role in promoting cultural expression, creativity and bringing people together in communities. In their 2021 manifesto, the SNP pledged to create a new £2 million fund for public art work. Seven months ago, I asked when this would happen, but no information was provided. Can the Cabinet Secretary give us more detail on what the pledge actually means and also when this commitment will be made? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I've just given uh, Sharon Dowie an, an overview of the level of financial commitment right across in the, the arts and culture uh, piece. She asked a very specific uh, question. I'll be happy to write back to her to update her about uh, progress in that area. But I hope she can be assured that the, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting arts and culture right across Scotland, and that includes the area that she has highlighted in questions this afternoon. And I have uh, several members seeking to ask a supplementary. I would intend to take each member who has pressed. Uh, supplementary, first of all, from Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. Um, with the summer festivals season approaching, Scotland's cities are ge gearing up for a very busy and vibrant few months, kicking off with the fantastic New Art Aberdeen Festival of Street Art, which begins on the 8th of June. What role does the Cabinet Secretary see culture and the arts playing in Scotland's ongoing pandemic recovery? I agree that culture can play an important role in the recovery from the pandemic and we know that participation in cultural and creative activities supports our well-being, not only at an individual level but also across our communities and for the country as a whole. And that's why I'm pleased to confirm the ongoing support for the culture sector. In the last year, Creative Scotland has provided £7.73 million in funding to festivals across the whole of Scotland through their regularly funded organisations and also their open fund. In addition, Edinburgh and Glasgow festivals have received £3 million from the Expo and Place Funds. Uh, and, and another important aspect of our cultural life is obviously our belt, built heritage. And I was delighted to be able to confirm this, this morning together with Historic Environment Scotland, um, the Silver City Heritage and Place Programme with the Aberdeen City Council, which I think will bring great benefits, particularly uh, in the regeneration of the east side of, of Union Street, which has high levels of, of vacancy. And I think that will make a huge difference to people in Aberdeen as well. And supplementary for uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has hit the culture and art sector hard. Uh, cherished and well-respected arts venue like the Film House here in Edinburgh uh, have been forced to close. Other venues such as Lit Theatre are in disrepair due to lack of support and funding. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what funding can be allocated to these struggling venues to avoid Scotland's valued arts venue closing for good? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm getting difficult with the presiding officer if I were to repeat the statistics that I, that I read out at the beginning um, of this uh, interchange with colleagues in the chamber. The Scottish Government has multi-million pounds commitments to the arts and culture sector, and I think that's hugely important. I think there's agreement across the chamber that that is, is worthwhile. Faisal Chaudhry, however, does hit the nail on the head when he highlights that there are significant challenges to cultural institutions, particularly venues, Yes, here, elsewhere in the UK, and internationally as well. And it is a challenge for all of us, for the artistic organisations in question, the venue management, our arm's length organisation, Creative Scotland, that is responsible for working directly with these arts organisations, and a Scottish Government that wants to ensure that we can protect as many of our venues as possible. I can assure him and other members that we are looking extremely closely at everything that we can do to make sure that the arts and culture infrastructure, including institutions that he has mentioned, uh, are able to, uh, uh, to continue and to thrive into the future. I remain seized of that. I know he will be too. And supplementary, be just wish it. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With high costs of travel and fewer accommodation options, islands and rural Scotland are expensive places for artists to visit and perform. Post-pandemic, there's been a loss of creative outlets and funding options have reduced. So how best can the Scottish Government work with local communities to ensure rural and island areas can continue to attract artists' produ productions and events to their areas? Cabinet Secretary. Can I just say, uh, uh, as a... As an introduction to my answer to Beatrice Wishart, I'm sure she would recognise that we are fortunate that Creative Scotland funds regularly funded organisations right across Scotland, including uh, our island communities, and I think that's hugely worthwhile. It's also important 
uh, to stress that Creative Scotland's um, uh, uh, grant priorities are also aimed at supporting culture and the arts throughout Scotland. I know that there's a lot of active thinking going on in Creative Scotland about how they can give maximum financial assurance to the creative and art, our art sector over a multi-annual basis so one is able to plan, including touring, including performing in different parts of the uh, country, and whether that's people going to Shetland or people from Shetland wanting to perform elsewhere in Scotland, I agree with her that that is hugely important. Uh, I'm sure that Creative Scotland will be listening closely to the points that she makes, and I'd be happy to underline that when I meet with them next. Question number seven, Ashwin. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to review its prospectus, for an independent Scotland in light of reported divisions within the independence movement. Minister Jamie Hepburn. As set out in the First Minister's recent policy prospectus, Equality, Opportunity, Community, New Leadership, A Fresh Start, the people of Scotland will be given the information they need to make an informed choice about whether Scotland should become an independent country. This government will build the case for a thriving, socially just, independent Scotland. Ash Regan. I thank the Minister for that answer. Presiding officer, I think many people across the UK at the moment uh, looking at their power bills, their household bills, will be looking at the problems that are facing the UK and many people in Scotland I think at the moment will be considering and concluding indeed that an independent Scotland is more important than ever. Now with that in mind, I think a cohesive, um, a vibrant, creative, cross-party, wider movement is important in that way. It's important for designing a successful campaign. It's important for presenting that united front and then going on to win majority public support. So would the minister agree with me that um, establishing an independence convention is not only imperative right now, it is also urgent? Minister. Well, uh, well, well, let me uh, agree with the point the member makes in respect of the urgency of uh, the requirement for Scotland to become uh, an independent uh, country. Uh, my task, uh, President Officer, of course, is to make the government's uh, case through the series of prospective papers that we will lay out. There are three already published. There will be more uh, to come. That's the activity that I will undertake. That will be laid out uh, before the people. And I think that will be a key part of uh, making the case to the uh, wider public. And when I uh, take the temperature of the independence movement at this a moment on time, I see a real uh, sense of unity of purpose, a determination to work collaboratively uh, towards that end, and I intend on playing my part in that regard. I have a number of supplementaries. Uh, first, Donald Cameron. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. Can I take this opportunity to warmly welcome the Minister uh, for Independence to his new post? I know he'll work very hard on a subject that is clearly not a priority for the Scottish people right now. Um, it's obvious from recent weeks that divisions in the independence movement have been trumped by divisions in the SNP. We've been treated to an internal melodrama of backbench rebellions and infighting. So can I ask him this? On that note, the minister's colleague, Joanna Cherry, recently described the Scottish government's independence papers as lightweight. Does he agree with her? Minister. Well, let me thank uh, Mr Cameron for his uh, overdue a warm welcome, certainly warmer than I've heard uh, uh, thus far. I have to say in, uh, it's uh, an interesting uh, perspective to say that uh, we have no uh, case uh, to uh, our ability to make the case for uh, independence. Of course, this government was uh, elected yeah, yeah. on uh, the platform of uh, advancing uh, that particular uh, case. We have, I believe, uh, published three compelling uh, prospectus papers, and I can tell him I intend to publish many more yeah, yeah. in the coming months. And supplementary, Neil Bibby. Uh, can I ask the Minister for Independence what budget he has and how many civil servants are working directly to him? Minister. Uh, well, of course, that question has been put to me uh, in the written form by uh, a number of uh, members. Uh, in respect of uh, my own uh, part, there is only one uh, civil servant working directly uh, to me, that is my private secretary, of course, uh, right across the entirety of governments incumbent on civil servants to respond to the government's priorities and independence is one of them. In that regard, the civil service is working towards our agenda. Yeah, yeah. Supplementary, Willie Rennie. Uh, we should be grateful to, to Ash Regan for genuinely and honestly uh, referring to the divisions in the independence movement, but she's also been incredibly creative with her most 
interesting suggestion about bringing the strange friends in from the cold. So will the Minister for Independence be seeking the advice from the former First Minister Alex Salmond when crafting his new prospectus? Minister. Yeah, I'll be working with uh, dedicated civil servants to craft the prospectus papers. And supplementary, Ivan McKee. Uh, I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that one of the many strengths of the 2014 campaign was the wide range of organisations that were part of the Yes movement at that time and continue to be. So can I ask uh, what uh, the Scottish Government is doing to engage with uh, organisations in the wider Yes movement and development of those prospectuses? Minister. It will, I, I am in a regular contact with a range of organisations. I'll be happy to engage with any organisation with uh, an interest in the future of Scotland, whether or not they support independence or otherwise, because at the end of the day, the future of this country is everybody's business. Yeah, yeah. Question number eight, Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the UK Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office regarding the reported communique to UK ambassadors and diplomats and their involvement in the Scottish Government's international engagements. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> I have written to the Foreign Secretary to ask him to withdraw this guidance, which will damage Scotland's interest and undermine devolution. More than two weeks later, I have yet to receive a reply, and which says everything about the disrespect shown by the UK Government thus far. Despite what these documents assert, there is nothing, there is nothing in the Scotland Act which precludes Scottish ministers from discussing any issue with other governments or indeed international organisations. And on that base, I had a very successful visit to Vienna this week, promoting Scotland's energy and promoting Scotland's space sectors, our commitment to human rights uh, and the rule of law, and our work to achieve net zero. As ever, I was grateful for the positive and the constructive support provided by the FCDO in capital, both from the Embassy to Austria and the Mission to the United Nations. Bill Kidd. <clears throat> Thank you very much for that. And as the Cabinet Secretary um, intimates, condescending Westminster attitudes could cost real jobs and real investment, like that announced by the Energy Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray on his recent visit to Japan of plans for a subsea cable factory in the Highlands, which will bring much needed jobs to that region and across Scotland. Westminster is endangering West, uh, direct foreign investment, which rose here in Scotland by 14% last year compared to 1.8% across the UK. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that we should all get behind Scotland's business and economy rather than meekly accept the Westminster Government's blatant contempt for Scottish interests? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> well, I thank the member for raising a vitally important reason that ministers travel overseas, namely securing investment and jobs for people in Scotland. My Cabinet colleague Neil Gray was in Japan last month with the announcement from Sumitomo, demonstrating the strength of confidence that investors have in our vision for a net zero economy. We have a world-beating pipeline of offshore wind projects, and the visit demonstrated the important role played by Scotland's international network and the value of growing and developing relationships with our partners around the world. This government will therefore continue to promote Scotland's interests and fight attempts to undermine devolution. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions on constitution, external affairs and culture. And there will be a very brief pause before we move on to the next portfolio questions to allow front bench teams to change position. Thank you. Thank you, members. So the next portfolio questions uh, is Justice and Home Affairs. And again, I would make a plea for succinct questions and answers in order to be able to take as many members as possible. And at question number one, I call Ariane Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Police Scotland regarding any changes to the policing of protests. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Signing officer, I regularly meet with the Chief Constable and his team. There have been no discussions regarding change to the policing of protests. 
While there has been recent significant changes to the legislation concerning public order policing in England and Wales, those provisions do not extend to Scotland and we have no plans to make any changes to the policing of protests in Scotland. Scotland has a proud tradition of peaceful protest and the Scottish Government is committed to uphold the democratic right to peace, peaceful public assembly. Ariane Burgess. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. There was widespread anger at reports of heavy-handed policing of peaceful protests at the coronation. The Cabinet Secretary's reassurances over support for peaceful protests here in Scotland is especially welcome following the disgraceful Public Order Act in England and Wales, which Labour now says it's keeping on the books, if in government. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that trashing the right to peaceful protests is yet another example of where Tories lead, Labour follows? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, President Officer, the uh, member makes a political point, which I am, of course, compelled uh, to agree with. And by contrast to the legislation um, that has passed in England that some have described as uh, draconian, uh, a piece of legislation that clamps down on our basic democratic uh, right to protest and also described as an anti-protest law that can be used to stop the public from seeking to hold even placards in, in, the, in the street. And by contrast, uh, we in this parliament will uphold uh, people's right to peaceful protest while always ensuring that balance between rights and uh, responsibilities. And supplementary, Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I'm glad to hear the Justice Secretary um, confirm that uh, there's no intention to go down the same route as the, uh, the UK government in this area. But as Ali Ann Burgess pointed out, there were concerns arising out of the uh, policing around um, the death of the late Queen. Um, there were also concerns in relation to COP26 about the use um, of stop and search um, and more general surveillance. So I wonder whether the Cabinet Secretary has or um, would intend to have discussions with Police Scotland about data gathering that I think could give us a greater sense of confidence that the human rights based approach to policing by Police Scotland is in fact being delivered uh, in, uh, in practice. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, Police Scotland is one of the most scrutinised public services um, in Scotland and has a very uh, clear track record and commitment to upholding uh, human rights and the position of Police Scotland uh, in terms of uh, policing protests is of course to engage, to explain, encourage and to do all that before they ever reach um, an enforcement um, stage but of course I will uh, discuss matters with Police Scotland as you'd expect me to do uh, on matters in and around data to explore uh, what, what would be proportionate and what would be possible. Question number two, Brian Whittle. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer to ask the Scottish Government what concrete action it anticipates taking on the proposals outlined in relation to Michelle's Law which were discussed in the debate in, on Michelle's Law campaign on the 6th of September 2018. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government has already taken action in line with the Michelle's Law campaign. We amended the parole board rules in March 2021 to make it clear that the board can take account of the safety and security of victims and families when deciding upon a prisoner's release. In addition, individuals registered with the Victim Notification Service are advised when a prisoner is first being considered for temporary release and those that wish to can provide their views about that decision to the Scottish Prison Service. Victims can also make representations to the Parole Board for Scotland when someone is being considered for parole. And furthermore, the Parole Board can also already set exclusion zones as a condition of parole licence, and parole licence conditions can include the requirement to be electronically monitored to stay away from a particular location or from named individuals, as well as monitoring that someone remains at a specified address at certain times. Brian Wizzo. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. I think uh, when you're sitting opposite a mother who uh, describes the unimaginable pain of losing their daughter uh, to murder, and then go on to describe how that is exacerbated by the murderer being allowed out of prison and not being notified of that, and that the murderer's father also uh, was allowed to walk past her house so many times, I think this brings Michelle's law into stark reality. The new Justice Bill does fail to introduce Michelle's Law despite Humza Yusuf previously promising action. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me that Michelle's Law would give victims the reasons for a release decision in full and require, require 
their safety to be considered in every case. Cabinet Secretary. President officer, I very much appreciate the um, issues that Mr Whittle has raised in this regard and how um, different parts of the justice system can actually uh, re-traumatise victims. But I hope he would accept that a change to the parole board rules, which are rooted in law, is indeed um, a change in, in legislation. Um, but of course, there is always more to do. We're currently in Parliament at stage two of bail and release, where there are improvements uh, we hope to the uh, victim support system. And in the not too distant future, we will, of course, uh, be debating the Victims, Witness and Justice uh, Reform Bill. So there will be ample opportunities uh, for Mr Whittle and others uh, to bring forward further uh, improvements as required. And supplementary, Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. I was very pleased to see victims at the heart of the recently introduced Victims, Witnesses and Criminal Justice Reform Scotland Bill. How will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that both victims and their families are supported to stay involved in the Bill's passage through Parliament? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the, the Bill has indeed been shaped and developed through engagement and consultation with victims and witnesses who have had the, the courage and bravery uh, to share their experiences. And I have been clear that I will continue to engage with victims directly and through channels such as the Victims Task Force, Victims Advisory Board and Rape Crisis Scotland Survivor Reference Group. And I am sure that victims, witnesses and their families and advocates will also make their views known to Parliament as the Bill progresses. Question number three, Alistair Allen. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle youth antisocial behaviour. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, we support local agencies to reduce antisocial behaviour and are investing in prevention and early intervention. Local agencies are well placed to deal with these issues and have a wide range of powers to tackle antisocial behaviour, including where appropriate it, warnings and formal measures such as fixed penalty notices and antisocial behaviour orders. As part of our broader support for prevention, we are developing a new youth work strategy uh, so that all of our young people reach their potential and between uh, 23 to 26 are committing £20 million through the cashback programme to support over uh, 33,000 uh, young people in communities around Scotland. Alice Drallin. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. No one, uh, not least uh, the elderly, should have to put up, of course, with harassment or intimidation. Um, sometimes, however, due to the age of the apparent offenders, uh, this ends up being a, a multi-agency issue, as she's mentioned. And there's oh, sometimes a perception, including for some, from some offenders themselves, that little can be done to challenge them. Uh, can I ask what more the Scottish Government can do to help uh, the police, social workers and schools uh, work together uh, with children, in, particularly in the 12 to 16 age group. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, the, me the member is uh, very right to be concerned about the impact of antisocial behaviour on some of his most vulnerable constituents, but I want to reassure him and others that something can indeed be done to address these issues and indeed on a, a multi-agency uh, basis. I'm aware that uh, there is a specific group that has been established in the Western Isles uh, involving key partners and I understand that local children's services have been developing plans to divert more young people in the area away from <laughs> criminalisation and are preparing a bid for uh, additional funding. And I also know that there are um, four partners in phase six of cashback for communities, uh, Ocean Youth Trust, Access to Industry, Youth Scotland and the, the, the Scottish Football um, Association as well that are all focused on diverting young people at risk uh, of participating in antisocial behaviour. But of course, enforcement measures are also available, including uh, talking to parents, issuing those formal warnings, um, acceptable behaviour contracts and antisocial behaviour orders may also be considered for children over the age of 12. Supplementary, uh, Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Retailers Against Crime Scotland have told me about two Lanarkshire teenagers using free bus travel to inflict chaos in shops across the country, with a particularly horrific attack in Edinburgh leaving staff injured. Glasgow's Chamber of Commerce previously raised concerns that free bus travel for under 22s is fueling some antisocial behaviour. So shop workers are asking this very specific question. Will the Cabinet Secretary consider finding a way to remove free bus passes from the small number of those who abuse them? 
Come Signing officer, um, I am advised that transport colleagues will be uh, undertaking a full re review um, of the uh, free entitlement, but it is important to, to acknowledge that it is a national entitlement to all young people for very good reasons. And I think we should all, always have our focus, perhaps less in the mode of transport, notwithstanding uh, the work that is done um, across agencies to ensure the safety of people who work uh, in public transport transport as well as other uh, citizens who are travelling on public transport. We, we really do need to get to the root causes um, of these behaviours um, and of course there is a number of uh, uh, well proven, well evidenced approaches to diverting young people from um, criminal activity and antisocial behaviour as I've already alluded to. Supplementary Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And in, in, indeed, to echo Alistair Allen's uh, key point, it's undoubtedly uh, a fact that in my constituency there's an uptake in this sort of antisocial behaviour, ranging from simple egg throwing through to the assault of security guards at fast food outlets, all of which are matters I've had to, to deal with. I just wondered if the Cabinet Secretary could uh, uh, answer whether or not any additional measures and consequences are being looked at in response to this. Because while no one wants to uh, lock people away or throw away the key, there, there is a feeling, as Alistair Allen pointed out, that there is no consequence to many of these actions. Cabinet Secretary. Poseidon officer, um, Mr Johnson raises an, an important point. While the overall statistics for antisocial behaviour do not show an increase, we also have to be fully cognisant that very often this is an underreported um, behaviour as, uh, as well. So the government is undertaking work with the SCCN to explore what the appetite is, what the benefits would be um, of revisiting some of our uh, past, more formalised approaches and whether they, there is a need to, to, to review that or not and if the member wishes to write to me I'll keep him fully informed of how we progress with that. And supplementary Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. So far the Glasgow City Council have unanimously agreed that lights in parks is the right thing to do to help with antisocial behaviour but meanwhile many people still are afraid and the, the council have said it's going to take years to do that. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary does she think lights in park could help with this and what more can the government do to help move things along more quickly in Glasgow? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, sign off. So I'm always happy to um, engage with partners at a local level and indeed um, MSPs about what would um, assist um, in their local area. But it is important to remember that what, what solution is best where is often best determined um, at a, a local level. And from my perspective, um, it, it tends to be a range of solutions that need to be uh, brought to the table because some of these issues uh, in terms of their, their causes and consequences are, are indeed complex. And brief supplementary, Peter Swishart. Thanks, Presiding Officer. Has the Scottish Government done any work to ascertain if there's any connection between antisocial behaviour and cuts in funding to youth services? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding Officer, um, this Government is indeed continuing to invest in youth services and if I refer the member uh, to my original answer to Dr Allen uh, where I out outlined the investment being made uh, in particular via the cash back for communities that will benefit 33,500 young people in Scotland. Question number four, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what work it has conducted to ascertain the public perception of the frequency of police patrols in their local area. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, Scotland continues to be a safe place to live with recorded crime at one of the lowest levels seen since 1974. Research shows people in Scotland are significantly less likely to be a victim of crime than those living in England and Wales. The Scottish Crime and Justice Survey regularly has well-established questions asking respondents for their perceptions of safety in their local area and of local policing. In 2019-20, 65% of respondents agreed that police in their local area could be relied on to be there uh, when they need them and 73% uh, agreed that crime in their local area was either the same or lower compared to two years previously. The latest findings will be published in autumn 2023. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The SNP Government's Crime and Justice Survey confirms that there has been a significant drop in the proportion of adults who were aware of police patrols in their area. In the year before Police Scotland was formed, 56% of people said they saw police regularly patrolling their area. That's now fallen to 37% in 2019-20. A regular police presence reassures local communities and can often deter crime from being committed, Cabinet Secretary. 
So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what action will we put in place to reduce the current Police Scotland's burden they are under and boost the presence in our local communities? Cabinet Secretary. Sign officer, policing uh, continues to be a priority for uh, this government and indeed we have ensured that there have always been year-on-year -year increases uh, to funding. But I would also uh, remind the member that 96% of adults uh, rated their neighbourhood as very or fairly good to, to live in and that 84% of adults uh, continue to trust the police. And of course, you know, public perception and the presence of police is indeed important. But we also have to recognise that given the nature of crime, is changing, uh, that under the stewardship of the Chief Constable, that sometimes how we police to matters has to change uh, with the times as well. But I know uh, that our police officers work very hard and do their utmost uh, to respond quickly, efficiently and to have a very visible presence. And supplementary, Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. The results of that Scottish Household Telephone Survey published last month showed 84% of respondents trusted the police, as the Cabinet Secretary has just said and that neighbourhood safety levels were also rated highly. But with that in mind, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what steps the Scottish Government has taken to ensure neighbourhood safety remains a priority? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, neighbourhood safety is a central priority for this government. We work for a society in which people feel and are safe in their communities. To that end, we will continue uh, with our transformative policies, including those outlined in the, the Vision for Justice in Scotland and our programme for government. And in doing so, we will engage with a range of partners, including the emergency services, but also the, the wider community safety organisations, which are referred to in an answer uh, to Mr Johnston, organisations such as the Scottish Community Safety Network, uh, Crime Stoppers and Neighbourhood Watch Scotland, as well as local community safety partnerships. Question number five, not large. Question number six, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how many frontline police officers have been trained to use and equipped with naloxone? Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Poseidon Officer, the Scottish Government recognises the vital role emergency services play in, pr in providing and improving a response uh, to drug overdoses. To date, 10,300 officers have been trained and equipped with naloxone kits. As of today, Police Scotland has recorded 201 administrations of naloxone, which shows how crucial this intervention is in helping to tackle these preventable deaths. And I want to thank each and every officer who has carried and administered life-saving naloxone. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The rollout to frontline police officers in naloxone began at last year's International Overdose Awareness Day and is an emergency first aid treatment for use in potentially life-threatening overdose situations. When does the um, Cabinet Secretary see the results of the use of naloxone um, on the figures for overdose deaths? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, there are many uh, factors that um, contribute to reducing um, overdose deaths, and obviously the national statistics are published um, every year in the, the, the summer months. But in terms of the uh, number of administrations of 201 recorded incidents, we are Police officers have administered uh, naloxone. They have done that in a, a wide variety of circumstances and locations. And um, on all but seven occasions, the individuals have survived their ordeal. Um, on the occasions where the individual did, did not survive, most were in circumstances where the officer suspected the person was already deceased prior to the police arrival, but administered uh, naloxone to give them the best possible chance of survival. And once again, Poseidon Officer, I, I want to thank uh, Police Scotland for their leadership in this area and their frontline officers for playing their part to save lives. Question number seven, Mercedes Vialba. To ask the Scottish Government how many fines have been issued by courts to companies for breach of health and safety rules resulting in workers' deaths in the last five years. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, in the period 2018-19 to 2022 to 2023, Information provided by the Crown Office indicates that 164 companies have been convicted and fined for criminal breaches of health and safety law. Information is not available relating to the number of specific health and safety cases where a death has occurred. 
Mercedes Biapa. The Health and Safety Executive found that Scotland has the highest rate of fatal injuries for deaths in the workplace of all UK nations. So it's highly concerning that no cases have been prosecuted in Scotland under the Corporate Manslaughter and Homicide Act 2007, despite 164 companies being legally deemed responsible for workers' deaths. Whilst this law is reserved, will the Scottish Government review why these cases are not being brought as corporate manslaughter and how it can make this option more accessible for victims' loved ones? Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, uh, of course the, the member is correct that that is concerning. Um, health and safety legislation um, is reserved and the, the legislation that she refers to was uh, UK legislation in 2007. And while there is um, an argument uh, progressed by some uh, that this legislation you know, uh, acts as a deterrent because it ensures organisations are aware that they must uh, meet the duty of care to employers and the, 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 the public, I think um, the, the member and indeed some of our other colleagues have um, narrated very effectively how this legislation um, in effect bypassed what was then referred to as the transco loophole as, a, as opposed to closing those loopholes. Um, but of course we'll consider further um, what more that we can do within our powers um, in this area and I do uh, recognise that the member and indeed Claire Baker have a long-standing issue um, in this area. And supplementary, uh, Marie McNair. Thank you, President Officer. The recent work of the SEC and the Scottish Hazards Group show that we need to consider the best way to reform legislation to better allow negligent companies uh, to be prosecuted. Uh, enforcement of safe working environments is essential too. It's a disgrace that the UK Government have cut the health and safety sector budget by 40%. Does the Cabinet Secretary also agree with the Scottish Hazards Group that only full devolution of health and safety regulation allowing convergence with existing de default powers will provide the necessary foundation of a health and safety system that protects workers and delivers justice for those impacted by health and safety failure? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I, I do uh, very much agree with the member, uh, given this Parliament's powers over health and safety is something that the Smith Commission considered but did not ultimately recommend. Um, I'm aware that the STU said that this failure was a missed opportunity to allow this Parliament to shape how workers can be better protected. And I am sure that many members would agree uh, with that statement, but this Parliament uh, would be able to do more to protect workers if those powers sat here. And question number eight, Sarah Boyer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Court of Sessions ruling that a nil cap for sexual entertainment venues under provisions in the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Act 2015 is unlawful. Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, the Scottish Government delivered new powers through the Air Weapons and Licence in Scotland Act 2015, enabling local authorities to set policy on sexual entertainment venues, taking into account views from stakeholders and the community. The judgment does not mean a nil cap is unlawful. Instead, the judgment made clear that the Council ought to be aware of the impact of setting a nil cap in their area. In response, the Council has delayed the introduction of a licensing scheme until 31st December this year and prior to this will carry out a statutory 12-week consultation to review its licensing policy on sexual entertainment venues. Sarah Boyd. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? When I previously raised the issue in the Chamber, her predecessor was very supportive of this policy. So although there is now a consultation ongoing, uh, what steps will the Minister and the wider Scottish Government now take to make modifications to policy and, if need be, to legislation to ensure that our councils can lawfully implement nil caps if that is their democratic decision after they have carried out consultation? Cabinet Secretary. Signing officer, um, I am very supportive of local areas who you know, uh, carry out their local consultations and come to a view uh, on what is in the best interest um, of their area. And if um, Edinburgh Council wish to continue to pursue a policy of nil cap uh, and follow due process, I will indeed be supportive of that. Um, I do not think the issue in this instance, although I'm happy to discuss further, I do not think the issue is uh, in relation to our policy as a government or indeed our, our legislation, uh, but my, my door is, is always open to the member and others on this matter. A supplementary, Ruth McGuire. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Through its equally safe strategy, the Government has long recognised that commercial sexual exploitation in all its forms is both a cause and a consequence of men's violence against women. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary for an update on legislation to tackle male demand and end that violence? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, President Officer, uh, the Member is uh, quite right uh, to make that uh, connection uh, and we have to ensure that our work in this area does indeed uh, align with Equally Safe and the Scottish Government continues to make progress to deliver on the programme for government commitment to develop a framework which effectively tackles and changes uh, men's demand for prostitution and to support those uh, with experience of it. There are, of course, several aspects of this work um, as I've said, uh, in particular around um, equally safe that recognises commercial sexual exploitation as a form of violence against women and girls and that there is a number of uh, reforms and measures that have been developed to underpin uh, this, th this work and will keep the member informed um, as we take it forward. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions on justice and home affairs, and there will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business. Thank you.